Okay, so this is a bit of backstory for anyone that might not know. A skinwalker is a type of witch in Navajo culture that has the power to possess, transform, or disguise themselves as any animal they want. A lot of the stories told to Navajo kids about skinwalkers are quite dramatic. They usually end up in either the skinwalker dying or the Navajo dying. They're meant to represent the complete opposite of Navajo cultural values, and so with that in mind, this is the top 10 scary skinwalker stories. Starting us off with number 10 are the Ash Bullets. This was from a native Navajo who was coming back from the Navajo Nation Fair with his family and grandmother. How many times am I going to say Navajo in this video, I swear. The conversation somehow got onto skinwalkers, but his grandma shut it down pretty quickly. That night, as he was just in bed, he heard something moving outside his house. Thinking it was a stray dog or something, he didn't think much of it, but then he heard the loudest distorted scream, shat himself, then ran downstairs and woke up his mother. Mom. They looked outside the window and saw this coyote thing limping towards the door, dragging his right leg as he did. It started scratching at the door and moaning, and all his parents could do was shout words and Navajo at it, telling it it wasn't welcome there. At this point, everyone in the house was awake and panicked, but his granddad knew exactly what to do. He went and got a handgun from a drawer and a bag of ashes. I don't know where he got this bag of ashes from, but he did. And he coated the bullets in it and loaded the gun. He went to the door shouting. Navajo words and then opened the door and fired twice, but the thing escaped unscathed. His granddad turned around and said, That's the fastest one I've ever seen. So he's a pro veteran at this, clearly. It was about 4 a.m. by the time everyone actually calmed down, and the family actually went to a medicine man the next day to be blessed against the skinwalker. Coming in at number nine is the giant beast. The Sherman family recall this one terrifying incident that's etched itself into their minds forever. One night back in March of 1990, a huge wolf like creature came down from the plains and spotted a group of calves that were in their pen. And when I say huge, you guys, I mean three times bigger than the size of a regular wolf huge. Like, that was big. The creature came and put its head through and tried pulling one calf fully through and out of the fence. Terry saw this and ran inside to get a gun and started just shooting it, but the creature was unfazed. He went and then got an even bigger rifle and after shooting the beast eight times, it finally dropped the calf. Now was their only chance, so Terry chased the creature all the way to the edge of the ranch, but by the time it got to the river and crossed it, its prints were just gone. They were present on Terry's side of the property, but had somehow vaporized on the other side. Bruh, what the hell is this creature that can survive more than eight bullet wounds from a rifle? Coming in at number eight, we have skinwalkers. In Navajo culture, the legend of skinwalkers is enduring. In fact, the legend is so widely perpetuated that a lot of people outside of the Native American cultures are very scared of them too. Skinwalkers are said to be witches who ascend to their superhuman powers by sacrificing slash murdering a close family member. Honestly, how awful. These skinwalkers can then take the form of an animal of their choosing, but they most commonly appear as wolves, owls, coyotes, foxes, and even crows. These witches are said to be extremely dangerous, and you do not want to encounter one for fear of invoking their wrath. What will their wrath do? Straight up murder, once again. These skinwalkers are said to be most commonly found stalking deserts in California, like Death Valley, the Mojave National Reserve, and Joshua Tree, so watch out. Filling at number seven slot is the delivery trip. This this one's from Reddit user Neptune420, whose dad ran a small delivery service in Farmington, New Mexico. One day they got a delivery for Window Rock, Arizona on the Navajo reservation, and the dad decided to take his Navajo friend Travis and his girlfriend with him as they wanted to see some family there. So they took two separate trucks and had walkie talkies with them so they could communicate between vehicles. The trip and delivery went fine, they had a great day, but then on their way back, that was when things really took a turn for the worst. They're driving towards a hill, and as they crest it, the dad sees what he thinks is a giant dog sitting on its haunches in the middle of the road facing away from them. He walkies his friend Travis in the other car, asking if he sees the dog, to which Travis replies, that is not a dog, speed up right now and hit it. Hysterically, he went on and said, hit it, JJ, you have to hit it, please, please hit that thing right now. So the dad speeds up and as they get closer, they see the dog's matted hair seems to have dried blood all over it, and just before they hit it, it turns around to reveal that it had a 
face. The face was a hybrid between a bear and a human, but it looked distorted and in pain. And as soon as they hit it, it screamed like it was drowning and then ran into the nearby field. They saw a cop a little while later, and Travis made them pull over and was completely on edge when he told the officer that they saw a skinwalker a few miles back and it had been following them. The officer, who was Navajo himself, turned white, stammered something unintelligible, and then got into his car and left. Very helpful. But what I took away from the story is the fact that the dad, no questions asked, just hit this thing. Like he didn't even question Travis, like, oh, why should I hit that dog? He just went from zero to 100 real quick, fast and furious real quick. Now, at number six is The Spy. After the Sherman sold the ranch, Colum, a biochemist working with the National Institute for Discovery Science, was on site when he saw something. In a tree about 50 yards away from the research team, a large humanoid creature seemed to be watching them. It was perched around 20 feet off the ground and was just casually, motionlessly sitting there. You wouldn't even have had the slightest clue it was there except for its yellow eyes that did not blink. The biochemist is not a wuss, so he fired at the thing, but it disappeared, leaving only one footprint in the ground. Upon investigation, it was this oval six inch track that looked like it had two sharp claws coming from out of the rear, kind of like a raptor print or something like that. But considering how deep the track was, they guess this creature was heavy as hell. Coming into number five, we have ghost sickness. In Native American culture, it is possible for a person to fall ill with something called ghost sickness. Navajo legend has it that ghost sickness can strike if a deceased person is not buried with the right rituals. If that is the case, the spirit of the deceased can become disruptive and make a living person ill. With ghost sickness, the sufferer will start having terrible dreams about the person who's died. They will become obsessed with their death. They will feel depressed and also physically weak. They may also start to hear voices. According to legend, the only way to recover from ghost sickness is to undergo a ritual performed by a religious leader, and often make adjustments to the burial of the dead to satisfy them. At number four is the party. This one's from redditor Trey underscore lightning, who said that anytime his mum would take him to her hometown on the reservation, she'd always tell him a skinwalker story. But this particular one was told to him by his aunt. Now back in the day, his aunt and her friends used to party a lot, and one day they got in a van, drove out to the boondocks, and just drank. A bit after after sunset, everyone was laughing and in good spirits when they heard what sounded like rocks being thrown at the van. The sound stopped, but then an even bigger sound followed, and they quickly realized someone or something had just jumped onto the roof of the van. They locked all the, they locked all the doors, and his aunt is in the driver's seat trying to start the engine, but obviously it doesn't start, like in every horror movie ever. Such timely engine failure, I swear. But anyway, the thing on the roof is still banging on the van, and then his aunt sees a hand with a long nails reach over the roof and start scratching the windshield. Then it jumps off and walks up to her window and just stares at her. And his poor little aunt at this point is just praying for her life, but then after a few minutes of panicking, screaming and staring, the thing leaves them and the van finally starts miraculously bang on time and they leave. Filling our number 3 slot is the sickness. When you're working or living in a supernatural extraterrestrial hot pot 24-7, you can't think it's not going to have a negative effect on your your mental or general health. Colin wrote in his book Hunt for the Skinwalker that some of the employees on the ranch would have physical symptoms of the supernatural phenomena. They would report various migraines and nosebleeds despite not having a history of having them. Portable trifuel meters would note sharp spikes in activity during the health symptoms despite having been calibrated and tested multiple times. What are the implications of that? What does that even mean? I don't know, but I feel like it's not good. Giant disembodied heads, anyone? Sure. Coming in at number two, we have the legends of the flying head. The flying head legend is most popular in Iroquois and Wanadot culture. Flying heads are thought to be produced from cats or from battles wherein people have physically lost their heads. Flying heads are giant, ravenous beings with neck length hair. Do you want to see a depiction? I actually am kind of here for them. I can imagine myself as like a giant, ravenous head sometimes. Some descriptions even have them with bat wings, and they're said to have an insatiable hunger, so insatiable that they're often led to eat people. Nonetheless, no man made weapon can kill them. The only way to be rid of them is to trick them into eating hot coals. 
Easier said than done, I think. And finally, at number one is The Thing. So this one, again, is from Joe, and he lived on the reservation when the story took place. He was home with his two brothers and dogs one night when they started making a lot of noise outside. People, you have to trust your dogs when they're barking at stuff outside. It's probably a skinwalker. In the middle of the night, Joe and his brother woke up because the barking started again. He went outside and saw that one of the dogs was just losing it near the truck. When he looked there, there was a really tall man there looking at the dog and then kicking it. When it looked up, it had a pure white face, a pure black smile, and red burning eyes. It came to him and towered over him, and all Joe could see was a deep red. Things are clearly not going well at this point. His brother finally came out of the house not knowing what was going on, and at this stage, the thing's hands were inches away from Joe's head. From what he could recall, its skin was black and it smelt like a bloated dead animal, and he was just stood there, unable to move or speak. The skinwalker let him be and went for his brother instead, which is what finally broke Joe out of this trance and made him really angry. He started baring his teeth at it and growling in a way he didn't even know he could do. He kept roaring at it while it smiled back at him, and his smile faded the angrier Joe got, and then he just ran away into the night. That's it. No murder, no clawing at the face, just ran away into the night. Starting us off at number 10 is the kettle. Terry Sherman moved onto the ranch with his family, but after everything they saw and experienced, he saw the 512 acre ranch only 18 months after. The family had seen multiple mysterious crop circles, giant yellow eyed creatures, unexplainable lights in the sky, and of course, the attack on their livestock. At one point, seven of their cows were either dead or missing, and the cause of death was particularly weird. One cow had a hole cut out in the center of its left eyeball, but had no other injuries. Another cow had the same surgical incision and had had a six inch hole cut out of its rectum. I mean, last time I checked, animals who attack can't just make surgical incisions like that, so mm. Other cows just had their blood drained, but if you asked anyone where the blood went, they wouldn't be able to tell you. A quarter of their livestock died this bloodless way. Cattle mutations is one thing, but the chemical smell that was present with each cow was very disturbing. For the cows that disappeared, their hoof prints would literally stop mid path like they had just vanished into thin air or had been abducted by something from above. Why have aliens always been so obsessed with cows? I don't get it. It's like the most repetitive motif in time. What is it with cows? Do you want to meet the Native American Voldemort? Coming in at number 9, we have The Legend of Two-Face. This is a morality lesson and a scary urban legend at the very same time. The Legend of Two-Face, often called Sharp Elbows or Hester Voto Kio, is about not giving attention to bad things. The story is most popular among the Sioux people, and incantations can be found across a lot of First Nations groups. The story goes that the Two-Face creature is a bit of an attention hog, to put it lightly. They are a nasty presence that wants you to look at them. They will do anything to get your attention, but be warned, if you give in, if you look at it, if you give it the attention it craves, it will cut you. Actually, though, it will cut you. One legend is often told about a heavily pregnant Sioux woman. She heard a voice behind her, and intuition told her that she shouldn't look around. She was right. The strange voice tried even harder to get her to look, but still she did not. Later, she told her husband, and he was glad. He said that the voice had come from a malevolent creature that would appear to her four times. She must ignore it each and every time. If she successfully ignored it four times, it would leave her alone forever. Now, it did appear twice more, and twice she successfully ignored it, but on the fourth time, things didn't go well. The fourth time came and she decided to have a peek at the creature. Curiosity got the better of her, and she peered through a crack when she thought it was turned away. But what did she see? A ghoulish being with two two faces and razor sharp elbows. Its other face turned to look at her directly. It lurched out and cut her to shreds. Lesson being, never give in to negative voices, no matter how hard they shout. They will destroy you. At number eight, we have the lookalikes. This one's from Redditor Jibby Jam One, who was in New Mexico exploring some old Spanish ruins with some friends. While they were at one of the sites at night, they suddenly heard an angry, ear piercing, blood curdling scream, which prompted them to want to get the hell out of there. They went back to their camp, and a while later, the user went for a piss about 300 meters from the camp, and this is where things got weird. He remembered seeing two dust devils coming towards him, but when he turned around, it was just two of his friends who were motioning him 
willing to follow them, which he did almost like he was being sucked into doing so. He followed his friends for like 10 15 minutes, but as he was snapping back to reality, he realized these weren't his friends at all. His friends had bright red hair, and these two people's faces were identical to his friends', but they both had cat like eyes and were brunette. He stopped in his tracks and they turned to look at him as if they were about to kill him on the spot. He ran in a full sprint back to the camp where his friends hadn't even realized he was gone. Great friends you have, by the way. And he told them what had happened and they packed the hell up and drove back to Albuquerque. Filling on number seven slot are the lights. During the Sherman's short and not sweet stay at the ranch, there were a number of unexplainable lights and orbs in the sky. One time in the middle of the night, the family was awoken by what seemed like football stadium lights illuminating their house. Simultaneously, there was this musk like odor going through their home at the same time. On another occasion, the family saw huge shafts of light going from the ground to the sky, and this machinery sound coming from inside the earth along with it. Like, what the F? How deep have the aliens put their claws into the earth? The family had machinery coming from inside the ground. And what are these beams of light signaling even? Coming in at number six, we have stick people. Beware the stick people. While they may seem like cheeky pests, they're actually pretty malicious when threatened. The stick people are a legend from the Salish who live in British Columbia. They believe that in the woods there are a tribe of mystical people, stick people. They're a lot like other native tribes, but they're very elusive and they have have mystical powers. They communicate by using bird and animal sounds. In the woods, it is said that they will disorientate wanderers with mind control powers. Tricksters. Sure, the stick people are said to enter villages at night and mess with tribes, stealing their nets, eating their food, or simply just pulling down men's clothing. Classic. However, you never want to encounter a stick person face to face. This is why young First Nations children are warned never to enter forests alone. If you come across a stick person, they will feel very threatened, and the next time they enter a settlement, they will do more than steal food. Coming in at number five is the running man. This was from Brent Swanset, and funnily, enough, it also took place near Window Rock, Arizona. He was driving on the highway at night when he saw what seemed to be a large coyote sitting in the middle of the road. He slowed down so he wouldn't hit it, unlike that other user's dad, and he found that the coyote wasn't scared of the car at all. It didn't even move a muscle when Brent honked at it, so he just decided to save himself the trouble and drive around it. As he drove away, his dad turned to him and went, would you look at that? And he was referring to the coyote who was now chasing behind the car. The coyote then matched the the speed of the car running right alongside it, and then out of nowhere, the coyote becomes a naked running man, still keeping pace with the car, mind you. The man started slapping the car while having the creepiest grin on his face. Like, I can just imagine that, and it, I just, I just don't want to don't want to imagine it anymore. At this point they're going like 50 miles per hour but he's still there. To end his pursuit the man let out a loud wail and then swerved away. Either way Brent and his dad were terrified and I would have been too but for some reason I really can't shake the image that this naked man looked like the guy who plays Aquaman. I don't know why, it's just in my head. <laughs> and number 4 is the UFO. So we can all agree the Shermans have seen enough to last a lifetime. One night Terry looked out his window to see an RV parked in the pasture outside. Thinking the people driving may need directions or something, he decided to go outside and ask if they needed help. Good guy, Terry. The refrigerator shaped RV had a red light at the back and white light in front, and as soon as Terry went outside, the RV somehow rose into the air and flew out of sight. Out of sight. It flew. This RV that was clearly alien craft and not an RV flew into the ether somewhere. Like, can we talk about that? Coming into number three, we have the legend of the dust devils. Now the Ho people are watchful and wary of dust. Why? Well, because they're actually spirits interacting with the land in the form of a little whirlwind. Whether it's benevolent or malevolent depends on the direction the dust or dirt is spinning. In Navajo folklore, if you see dust spinning in a clockwise direction, everything's fine. But if it spins counterclockwise, well, you better have your wits about you as you are in the presence of an evil entity. Now at number two is the herd. This one's also from Reddit to Navajo Joe, which is quite fitting, I guess. But when he was a kid, him and his uncle were on their way back from chopping and gathering firewood. They were going slow on this dirt road, and Joe just had this feeling he was being watched, and he was about to look out his window when his uncle shouted, "Don't!" He then heard three taps on his window as his heart literally felt like it had stopped beating. His uncle started praying and going faster, and he thought all was okay. But then the truck dipped from the 
bed. At this point, his uncle just kept saying, Look at me, don't turn away, just look at me, please. And he heard the tapping again. Joe was now crying at this point as the truck dipped for the second and third time. Finally, his uncle gave a sigh of relief and said they'd both need prayers in the morning so the evil would forget their faces. When they got home, Joe called his uncle a while later because he had had a nightmare. His uncle said he didn't see any faces, just eyes, like they were just lights on the road. Joe asked him why he didn't just slam on the brakes when it was in the back, and his uncle replied saying because it wasn't alone. When I read that the first time, it legit just gave me shivers. Like, how can you end a story like that because it wasn't alone? That's a great. And finally, at number one are the orbs. Now, seeing flying orange circles is one thing, but seeing blue orbs is something else. Again, these orbs were the size of a basketball, but were a lot more dangerous. You could tell they were intelligently controlled or had a mind of their own since they traveled quickly around the ranch and would make sharp turns that needed superhero like reflexes to accomplish. One fateful night back in May of 1996, Terry was out walking through with his cattle dogs when he saw a blue orb whizzing about the field. He encouraged the dogs to go after it and they did, biting at it and whatnot, but it outmaneuvered them every time. And it did it just as their teeth were about to get it, so you knew it was teasing them. The orb led the dogs out to the brush and after hearing three distinct yelps, there was no other sound from them. The next day, Terry went searching for the dogs but couldn't find them anywhere. Instead, he found three round spots of dead vegetation and in the middle of them was a large black greasy lump, kind of like the orb had incinerated the dogs. Either way, they now Ever found them. Coming in at number 10, we have the Wendigo. The Wendigo is something that we like to talk about a lot on Life's Biggest Questions. The Wendigo is a lesson that can is never gonna end well. The legend of the Wendigo comes from the Algonquin people, which is actually relatively near to where I am here in Toronto. I've actually been to Algonquin National Park and I was scared of bears the first time I went, but the next time I will be aware of the Wendigo. The story of the Wendigo goes that once he was a lost hunter that during a particular harsh winter, and trust me they do get very cold here in Canada, got really really hungry. He couldn't find anything to hunt, he couldn't find anything to eat. This continued for days, for months. His hunger became so intense that he turned to cannibal after eating human flesh, he became a crazed monster and continued to roam in search of his next fleshy meal. Now the Wendigo, who is 15 feet tall, looks a little like this. Ooh. The Wendigo is said to roam free in the icy plains of Canada and the northern states of the USA, like Minnesota, Illinois, and upstate New York. The legend has legs, too. Literally. There have been several spates of Wendigo sightings over the past 150 or so years, most notably when a number of people from the Algonquin went missing in the 20th century. The Wendigo was to blame. The Wendigo is said to lure you away from civilization to icier plains and will then eat you alive. Hard no from me to Mr. Wendigo. Stay away. Coming in at number 9 is The Chase. So this was from a cop called J.G. Buckland and he recalled how he was once working the night shift at a hotel in New Mexico. He was patrolling the hotel in his car when he decided to take a nap, just what I like to hear from the cop. A bit after 2am, something hit the bottom of his car so hard it actually swayed. Mind you, this was a 1978 Thunderbird, so it was a big, heavy car. I mean, it's not easy to make it move. JG woke up and drove forward and saw there was a dog sort of thing sitting where his car had been. But as he started looking at it, he felt like he was drowning in this dark energy and that this thing was just pure evil. The face of the dog had human features, mostly the eyes, but it didn't have a snout nose. That bit also looked more human and it wasn't black tipped like a dog's nose. Size wise it was slightly bigger than an adult German Shepherd which are pretty big in and of itself. With this in mind, JG decided to hit the dog with his car, but it ran off the property but then back onto the property so he started driving after it. It made its way into a third parking lot and then into a weedy area and at this point JG was chasing it on foot with his gun. It came up and threw him aside like he was made of air and then ran away. This thing ran into the weedy area on four legs and exited on two. So the dog was now a nude man that was screaming as it left and after after that encounter, JG had such bad luck, health problems, etc. After this, so he actually went to a shaman to get cleansed from this experience. And I want to be cleansed from telling the story. 
today we have the spheres. We've covered humanoid beasts and drained cattle, and now we're gonna dive into floating spheres. This place really is a mess. Now during the family's 18 month stretch at the ranch, the one thing they said they saw the most of were floating spheres. Different colors, different sizes, just so many of them. 12 separate incidents were reported where the family and their visitors saw giant orange circles flying over the trees on the ranch. If that's not bad enough, Terry saw the orange circle open up and smaller other spheres would just come flying out of the middle. One of the Sherman's neighbors even confirmed seeing some flying orange basketball in the sky. That wasn't a basketball, my friend, that was Zektu from Planet Foot Doop. From Skinwalkers to Skinwalker Ranch, up next at number seven. Some weird things have been happening at the so called Skinwalker Ranch in Utah. Native Americans in the area truly believe that the area is plagued and cursed by evil spirits, and well, they might actually be right. The ranch became notorious in the media when the Sherman family spoke out about their experience living there in the 1990s. Their stories involved strange lights, ghostly apparitions, and the tale of an invincible wolf that I found particularly interesting. It seems that the Sherman family came across what seemed like a friendly wolf. So friendly, it approached them from time to time. Sadly though, the wolf could not be trusted. It killed a number of their cattle, which are expensive to come by. Now this prompted the head of the Sherman family to shoot it with a .375 Magnum. Nothing. It was struck again. Nothing. The wolf was shot several times more, but it simply walked away. Was this an encounter with a real life skinwalker? Maybe. Now at number 6 is the walking coyote. Now this one's from redditor Endelos, who said during the early 80s her sister was on the way back from a friend's at night when her car broke down. Thankfully she broke down in front of a family friend's house so she went in and called her dad and he came to get her. They were driving back at around 10pm and were passing a heavily wooded area when out of nowhere they hear an incredibly loud inhuman scream. The user's dad hit the brakes just in time to see a 6 foot tall coyote with a black and white striped tail walking on just 2 legs. Thankfully I don't think the sister or dad were its true targets because it disappeared quite quickly after that, but then they heard the same scream again only 10 times louder than the first time. This time the dad didn't break, he accelerated out of that situation ASAP. Coming in at number 5 are the groceries. Most of the stories I was reading were mostly extra terrestrial related, but this one seems kind of paranormal, which I clearly have a lot of experience with seeing as I'm a host on this channel. One day Gwen aka Mrs Sherman was coming back from the grocery store and put down her bags. Then like any normal person she unpacked all the bags and put them where they needed to be, the fridge, the shelf, the freezer, whatever she wanted. She folded up the bags and went to pee but when she got back she saw all the bags back on the counter filled with all the products she had just put away. Now <laughs> how the hell did that happen? happen and who or what did it? I mean A she just went and unpacked all that so this entity just cancelled out all her productivity. B if you want to mess with someone there are better ways to do it than that. Next up next at number 4 we have the Chindi. So the Chindi is said to be bad energy left over from a person who has died. The Chindi is produced when a person takes their last breath. Actually a lot of first nations people believe it is much better for people to die out in the open as it leaves more space for the Chindi to disperse. Dying inside a house practically dooms that building to being haunted forever. The Navajo are so wary of invoking Chindi that will actually get rid of a deceased person's possessions. Even saying a deceased person's name is a certain way to summon their bad energy. Just don't do it. Filling our number 3 slot is the white powder. This one comes from an anonymous Navajo woman living in Shiprock, New Mexico. She said during one of her visits home she heard her dogs relentlessly barking at something outside and that she had a loud thud above her on the roof. Her sisters got quite scared and her parents assured her it was just a dog or a cat and just to go to sleep. Parents really need to stop telling us it's just a cat or a dog because clearly as we've seen it's not. But anyway the dogs were continually barking and running back and forth and then she had a metal pole hit one of the dogs and she knew it was a pole because her sister had put it on the roof the day before. She tried to get up but fell into a deep sleep and the last thing she heard were human footsteps on the roof. The next day there was nothing suspicious on the roof or around but her cousin did complain about her head hurting and the next day she straight up 
died just like that. They brought a medicine man to conduct a ceremony and he said that two of you know exactly what happened. He went on to say it was a man in bare skin on the roof of the house and he was using a hummingbird as a lookout and a helper and he blew white powder onto the woman's cousin which is why she died but that was also the reason why everyone in the house fell into a deep sleep that night. The ceremony went on and the woman later found out that the powder used was crushed human bones taken from graveyards. As if this story wasn't screwed up enough. Now on number 2 are miscellaneous incidents. There were so so many more stories from the family that didn't fit under just one category or title so I was just like let me just file them all under miscellaneous incidents. <laughs> the family would just be working outside in the pasture and hear floating voices above them talking to each other. Where were the ghostly voices coming from? No idea. Alien related things like circular ice patterns, crop circles and huge holes would just randomly appear all over the property overnight. The family hardly ever slept and any time they did they would always have violent nightmares and turns out a lot of the family members had identical dreams which is no coincidence. The Shermans two children were honor students before their parents bought the ranch but after moving there their grades plummeted hardcore. After being late too many times and sharing strange office stories Gwen was also fired from her job. In an attempt to protect each other the family started sleeping on the floor of their front room. I feel so bad this family is probably so scarred from this whole experience I can't even begin to imagine. Finally coming into number one we have the owls. I really like this tale of how owls were created and it's pretty scary and may make you feel not so great about our murderous feathery friends. As told by the Yakama, the story goes that there was once five sisters who lived in a cave. These sisters were no normal humans, in fact they would eat vile things like frogs, lizards, snakes and mice, things that other first nations people simply wouldn't eat. Some even said that they would eat tribes people if they took a dislike to them. Were these five sisters the native equivalent of witches? Quite possibly. They seem to be in touch with a lot of bad energy and cause a lot of people a lot of problems. Luckily for the other tribes though, one by one the women died. Finally, everybody breathed a sigh of relief as the final sister drowned. You would think that would have been the end of it, but no. From one of her eyes, it is said that all owls were created. Sure, because Owls. Now when you see owls, apparently they are a small part of the evil fifth sister, part of her soul that's always watching, watching and waiting. But for what? Owls. Who knew? 